Jack. Sir. All right. What are we uh, What are we going to cover today? Well, you know, I was doing a little bit of work running around, and I had a, a thing pop into my email window that said, you should really read this article. It's about four steps to building a cybersecurity strategy. And I said, how nice. Someone had distilled this complex job into four steps. And I said to myself, and I said to the great McDubswell, maybe this would be a great thing to talk to my favorite former CISO about one Justin Finlay and see what you thought about these four steps. So to give you a really quick view, and uh, for the, and we'll actually, of course, put the notes and headlines, what have you, in, this, in um, the show notes. But there are four steps, which was, number one, understand your cyber threat landscape with some things under it. Number two, assess your cybersecurity maturity. Number three, Determine how to improve your cybersecurity program. And number four, document your cybersecurity strategy. So as I read this, which was supposed to be a way in which to simplify, distill down the difficult tasks, complex tasks, cybersecurity management, I was like, wow, this is like two years worth of work if you really stop and think about it. But then I said to myself, I think I'm going to ask you, what stands out to you about this approach? Okay. And are these the right four steps? Is this is this four steps for four steps sake? How does it strike you? My first reaction is it was written by someone who's actually never done this before. Hmm. And the, the reason I say that is like, these are, these are great recommendations. If you're doing this in a vacuum with no external variables and with infinite resources. But for anybody that's ever done this in a real business, you realize that is actually never, ever the case. And while I think all of these are important steps, I think the, um, the couple that were left out here is the first one is after understanding your cyber threat landscape, which I think is, is important. You also need to understand your organization's tolerance for risk mitigation. Hmm. Around roughly the same time as you're assessing your cybersecurity maturity, because there could be a reason that you are either overly mature or under mature or whatever the situation is. But in the course of, course of measuring yourself, um, it's great, it's great to recognize that, you know, maybe you have some opportunities for improvement, but if your organization is never, ever willing to improve, um, that's going to be factored into your strategy. Right. And it's saying like, maybe, maybe your strategy at that point is just transference. You would just want to transfer risk. Right. So that's, that's kind of, that's one kind of glaring hole in reality here. Um, the other one uh on the other side of this is saying you know uh determining how to improve your cybersecurity program and documenting your cybersecurity strategy there's a giant piece in here just saying you document your strategy you document your roadmap you have to get consensus and buy-in from the organizations which you plan to deploy this into right in the absence of doing it it's it's just a great idea for someone stuck in the stuck behind a desk with no interactions to other people. And if you don't get other folks on board, this ain't going anywhere. So, um, you know, I think those, those two things alone, to me, I think are the difference between the haves and the haves not. So is, is, is this thing going to go or is it not going to go? Right. And I think those two aspects um, to me are what separates security leaders. Like, from leaders from practitioners in the sense where saying like, is you're just someone who's going to turn a crank and just kind of be a practitioner and do this thing? Or are you going to be a leader, someone who's out there influencing organizational change and understanding organizational tolerances and trying to pers persuade people within the organization to self-select behaviors of risk mitigation? Or are you just going to keep doing your thing in the corner and hope people pay attention, right? And then on the other side of it too is saying once you have a plan, 
you believe this is the right course of action for the organization, can you can you stretch it out in a way? Can you create a roadmap in a way that which makes this thing palatable for the organization? But most importantly, are you going to be able to get your organization on board with this? Because you can wave your hands, you can do jumping jacks, you can do backflips, but at the end of the day, if no one else is participating in your game, this isn't going anywhere. So um, so for like all intensive purposes, like I think these are like for starting steps to think about building a security strategy, but by the way, to actually do it is a lot more involved. So <laughs> as, as I'm listening to you as usual, right. And as I'm looking at these, these steps and you mentioned the combination of sort of appetite for risk slash appetite for risk mitigation, and you talk about sort of the communications on the other side. It, what struck what struck me about it was there's nowhere in here does it talk about understanding what business you're in. Yeah. Right. I mean, just basically, it says you know understand the cyber the cyber threat landscape, which is fairly consistent, right? But if I'm a retailer relying on um, commerce platforms for high volume transactions, or if I'm a biomedical researcher, uh, perhaps doing some new sort of ph pharmaceutical treatment or something two very, very different businesses. And I have to assume that the cybersecurity strategy should probably start with the business strategy. And maybe from that, I can evolve some of those questions that you just asked, which was, all right, now set, you know, my first off, sort of my starting risk appetite in my organization. And then maybe part of my strategy has got to be evangelism, finding folks who are willing to change, doing a better job of communicating um, finding supporters in the organization, uh, establishing budget, establishing um, an expected cost for security done badly, cost for security done well. So I think maybe what I'd like to see a little bit more is that there's more of, and we've talked about this a lot in the show, that there's more of a focus on the head of security or the head of IT who runs security as a business executive unless as a figure out how many widgets they got to buy. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When I was hearing you talk, the first analogy that kind of came to mind in my head, it would be like if you were going to build a house, mm -hmm. you go to the architect and say, hey, I, I would really like to build a house. And they said, okay, I got you. I'll be back <laughs> in a week. And they come back in a week, haven't asked you any questions. They don't know anything about you or your family or your lifestyle, what you choose to do when you're home or when you're not, whether you need a garage, whether you don't, they just come up with their own plan in a corner without asking anybody any questions, without interfacing with anybody. And they give you the whole blueprint and say, okay, here you go. Here is the answer to what you're looking for. Now go out and buy a builder. Right. And then they're, and they're surprised. And they're surprised when you're like, yeah, this is a non-starter. This is not what I'm looking for. <laughs> Right. Or if you don't know, maybe it's the first time you've ever lived in a house. You're coming from the happy yurt community um, from Secret Canyon. You're off buying a yurt. Now you're saying, all right, now I got to have a house. You're like, all right, I'll take that house because you know best because you're the house person. You're the architect. Yeah. And then and then they're surprised or you're surprised that it just doesn't work for you. Right. Wow. There's there's seven bedrooms in a single bathroom. Right. With a tub. Wow. This, this doesn't work for me. Or. It's a 5,000 square foot house and I'm, you know, living on a fixed income and I don't have enough money to pay for heat here in Saskatchewan. Yeah. Right. So they didn't ask the question. Yeah. And I think that's exactly right. And I, um, it's interesting. I, there was a point in time in my life where we had a small, small renovation, uh, at our house and the guy who came in and did the renovations, um, he spent a lot of time with me and my wife asking us questions about how we plan to use the room. Right. And spent a lot of times like, you know, if we kind of set this up this way, like, what would you put in this corner? What would you put in that corner? Like, how would you use this space? What if, what if we created or we built in this shelving system? Could, would you use it for storage? Right. And he started kind of like asking leading questions based on his experience, having done it with other people. Right. And so, but when the time came, he gave us a plan and blueprint. He said, based on what I heard you say, we're going to set things up this way. This is how we're going to build it. We're going to build shelves here because you could put, you know, whatever it is we're putting in there. More importantly, like 
he even went as far as to plan the outlets, which is something I never even thought of. Like, sure. Where, sure. Like, where's, where are the outlets going to go? It's important because that's where you need to run electricity into, right? And he's going to subcontract the, um, the electrician to do the work. Um, but he even had the outlets in the right place. Like, for example, one of the places was like, we have a desk, right? Where I'm going to, was hoping to do work make it kind of like an upstairs office kind of thing. Actually, it was the beginning of COVID. And um, like kids are home downstairs, right? I need a quiet place to go. And um, he had outlets around like one corner of like where we had planned to like set up desks and stuff. And I kind of asked him, I was like, hey, like, why do we set up this way? He's like, because you're going to need the outlets for your monitors, for your charger, for your desktop for all the other things that you're going to have up here. And I was like, yeah, that actually makes a ton of sense, you know, but in the course of all this, like what he proposed, like he knew, he knew the person that he was building this for. He knew the person, uh, in our case, the pain points that we had, what outcomes we were looking for. And then at the end, he came back and said, he put everything together, got a reasonable idea of cost. Cause he understood like what, you know, what our range were was, and then he came back and he, he sold why this configuration worked for us. And it, but more importantly, it didn't sell it. Like he just educated us. So like he helped us mm. understand it. And I think that was, um, it was a pretty big difference for us of like, say like whether this was a starter or non-starter is like, it worked for us because he met us where we're at. And I think for this approach here, for this type of security strategy, this is, this is why people go off the rails so hard and so often is because they think if, you know, you just, you just understand the landscape, which by the way, at this point is 2023. Like I think just about everybody does. NIST tells you that this is a prescribed way of doing it, whether it's 853 or CSF, whatever version it is, 171, right? Just follow that recipe. By the way, like for most organizations, these are like non-starters, like, it's using a cannon to hunt a mosquito. It's not going to lie, right? And then more importantly, like, because we understand it as practitioners, and this seems like common sense, like, the people we're working for don't know. Like, this isn't their core business, so you have to educate them, right? And so what happens is, like, we put people in leadership positions that are slightly introverted and are uncomfortable talking to people and are uncomfortable educating people because they think everybody else should know. And what ends up happening? Disappointment and tears. And we're right back having the same conversation again 10 years later. So let's avoid that conversation 10 years hence when I'm even more of a fossil. <laughs> How about this? As a service to our valued listeners, let's uh, do our own four steps to building a cybersecurity strategy. I've got some little notes I've been taking, right? <laughs> but uh, but let's, let's, let's just talk this through. And after it's done, we'll put you know, pen to paper, fingers to keyboard, and we'll punch it out and we'll make this something we stick along with the show notes. But listening to you talk and my own inner voices, you know, telling me what to do. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking I'm gonna, I got like four, I got like four steps, right? And so I'm gonna ask you to sort of illuminate them or adjust them if I'm, if I don't have it right, as we sort of walk through these based on my experience and your, your own heavy commentary. So the first step I would say, because I'm only gonna give us four steps, right? We can go back and edit, you know, McDubster is clearly, she is a professional at editing our nonsense. So we can always clean this up. But so number one, your first thing to do, I'm saying, I'm calling it ask and understand. Yeah. So first off, find out what business your company is really in. In other words, where is technology enabling the business to be successful? Uh, number two, what, this is the point you had made, what tolerance do they have for making changes in support of improving security to meet those business objectives? Number three, what are the plans going forward? How is the business gonna change? What plans are already in play for the way the technology and the environment, the customers or the service delivery type is gonna change? And then number four, who can you identify internally that is either a supporter or um, someone who's going to challenge these ideas and what's the overarching organizational willingness to think about cybersecurity or understand cybersecurity. Yeah, I think those are, those are all spot on. Um, each, I, I think 
each one of those, like we can we can pull those forward a little bit more. So I think as we write this up, um, we can we can further develop the concepts. But I think they're they're all they're they're all there. It's is understanding like understanding your business, not only like what your industry is, what challenges you have, but like politically. Oh. Hmm. Like what's the like uh, to use your words like what's what's going to be the tolerance for change? Just like, are people welcoming of change, or is this going to be like like are you going to have to go on a campaign and really like evangelize this across the organization? Um, plan plans going forward. That was your third one. Um, I think it's great. The piece that um, I see people uh, uh, be a little bit over anxious on is like they try to do too much too fast hmm so pace it pacing pacing that's uh that, yeah, that's a great word it's awesome it's like yeah. you don't you don't have to shove the entire buffalo through a garden hose here right like you can you can stretch this out over a period of three four years right and by the way like that can help you like sell it or educate your organization and saying like hey you know what you reserve the right to get smarter as you go like let's take baby steps in year one um, which can include these initiatives. We have to maybe hire this person or outsource these activities. Um, when we're done with year one, this is what success looks like. This is how we know we've been successful and we're ready for the next steps. And you can kind of like walk it out that way. Most people think about that in terms of years because those are like, um, so nice, nice like block of time, like fixed set of time. And that's typically when budget cycles go. So it's typical end and starting. Um, and the, the last one here, just uh, internally, your, your fourth comment, we've said this before in other, other episodes, is you have to find a way to light the torch, right? And so this is, the, this is a place where you bring others in and you use it for the purpose of evangelizing the mission, evangelizing the plan, but you also use it as a way to bring stakeholders in and get them to light the torch. The goal being that if you, um, you know, get hit by a truck, whatever, whatever scenario, whatever analogy you want to use, that you still have others there that can carry this forward with you. But more importantly, like you want them carrying your strategy forward, but which means you got to bring them on a journey with you. Yeah, I like it. There's something you said there that's so authentic, which is if I'm asking them questions, I'm trying to understand their part of my business. I'm trying to understand their plans as they express it to me. And I learn these things. They're going to become champions for me. They're going to become supporters. I think that's a fantastic ad. So let's say this. So there's step one. Now we understand the landscape. We understand the personalities and the politics. So for me, step two is to apply your experience as a cybersecurity leader, whoever's, whoever's doing this, plus what's available through re resources like the frameworks, like the recommendations, like all the mentors that exist in our networks to actually determine both the threats and where you think you should be. Like the protections that should be in place based on what you believe are the threats because now you have an encyclopedic understanding of your business. And so, as opposed to the first steps in the article that we we're referencing, which were, you know, understand the cyber threat landscape and then understand the standards bodies and see how you, you know, how you're doing. I'm suggesting that the second step after really getting to understand the business that you're trying to support is to create what you believe with your experience and what you can learn is the appropriate controls to have in place, the appropriate policies, operational measures in place to keep the team secure and write it all up. Yeah, you know, the piece where where I see people get hung up on this one is uh, too often being in a position of having the authority to create a security strategy is uh, security leaders tend to think it is their sole responsibility to deliver on the security strategy. But the result is like, this is an organizational wide thing. And like a real, real easy friction point that I see all the time <clears throat> is security and IT often rub against each other. And, you know, I don't know, you may think like we have, like we gotta get a email gateway in place, whatever, mm. you put in whatever you want. 
maybe the IT team is, is the ones that's actually responsible for implementing and maintaining that. And they have a different solution that might conflict with like what you actually want to do. And the question that I would ask yourself in those situations is saying, you're trying to get others to come and play with you. You want them to participate in your journey because at the end of the day, it's not really about you, it's about what you're doing for your organization. The question that I would ask, if you find yourself in that position, you know, on a journey of trying to figure out what the tolerance for change is, was saying, do you want other people to participate in your strategy or do you want to try to prove that you're right? Yeah. And which of those two will actually make the organization more secure, which at the end of the day is, is the business. The people, there's, there, there, there's been a lot of security leaders I know that are like really capable people. They, they never make it through the front door on change because they're so, their egos do not, do not allow them to cross that chasm and to participate with others. And the result is, the organization is the one that ultimately suffers. So now we have an understanding of the business. We believe we have a picture of what is the appropriate tractable, digestible security controls that should be in place to make this organization secure. My third step is that now you figure out how you're doing. So you use this as two different things. Number one is obviously the measure, right? So I suggested all these things should exist. Oh, I didn't realize we didn't have a firewall over there. I didn't realize we had didn't have MFA on systems administration functions or whatever, right? And you go through the controls you think you should have from step two, and, and in step three, you're starting to see how you're doing. You're documenting where you're on and where you missed, and you're also doing this in concert with the people who own those areas of responsibility. I love your note about IT because there is there's a ton of friction. Hey, we need to go do this, but that's hard, so I don't want to do that. Or there's a security policy that says we're going to do this and you're going to change my policy. It's going to change all my desktop administration. I'm going to go crazy. But if you can involve IT administration and business unit leaders, and what have you, in your measurement of how they're doing, you think about that conversation, at least in my imagination, right? It's, hey, everybody, I'm coming over to visit because we're going to talk about what we think is the right thing to do. And we'd like to find out how we're doing. Oh, why are you asking why we're doing this? Let me explain to you why we think this control is important before you even know whether they have it or not. So it's completely not loaded, right? This is not going to be painful at the start because you're just explaining why you think something should exist. And you may learn something, right? Uh, to your point about the fact there's different personalities, somebody may say, oh, you know, MFA, kind of interesting, but what we decided to do instead was X, right? Or we actually use a federated identity store, blah, 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 right? So they've got all these other things that they may be doing, but you're giving them the opportunity to sort of self-report and make sure that they understand. So in step three, it's this measurement of how you're doing against the controls you think you should have set up in step two, based on your understanding of the business in step one. And you're actually giving the organization the capacity to give you the response. So you're not just judgy McJudgerton sort of going around telling people they're screwing it up. The piece that I would kind of expand on is for people that have done this before, mm. it's really your chance to shine by educating the people that you're looking to bring along with you, right? And it's um, in the course of building out a strategy here, um, there's a lot of dependencies that exist in different facets of security. There's, there's a whole bunch of examples where uh, in the hopes and aspirations of doing this one thing requires that you do this pre-step first, right? And that, the order of operations start to matter about how you execute on a strategy. And I, I can't think of a good example right now, but um, even taking NIST as an example, there's, there's a lot of things before you can get to an advanced step, you need to do some of the prerequisite work. Um, and being, like, being an advisor to the people that, uh, who are stakeholders within your organization is a way to get big brownie points and you can get a lot of, um, you can earn a lot of political capital by helping others look good and helping them uh, be smart, right? And good at their jobs. And I, I think there's, there's a lot to be said for that. I love it. So now we're exiting step three and you've got champions who are informed to educate, they're educated. They may not be particularly thrilled because something may be more work, but at least they all agree. 
that there's value in it, right? And you'll talk together to figure out everybody gets the resources that they need. And you've got your gaps and you've got your areas of strength all identified. Um, and I'd say that step four is actually what it feels more like is the systemization or the processization of what you've figured out. So now you document, the, now that you understand the sensitivities, capabilities, availability of the resources internally, and to use your point about pacing from step one, because you learned it back then, right? How fast they can move. And you say, from what I've learned, I believe I see a three-year plan. So it's not so much a cybersecurity strategy, which we'll talk about in a sec, it's more of a cybersecurity plan, right? Which now says, I'm gonna do the following sets of things with the following sets of benefits. And I've heard you give this discussion before, which is as long as people understand what the next thing is that's supposed to be going on, they can choose not to do it because at the same time, they're assuming the risk and the, the impact of what it is because you you and historically have taken the time to help them understand it. And what I'd say is the, thought, the, the only additional part to this, because now you're just, you and all your supporters, right? You're going like in a little mass up to the board of trustees or to you know the folks in charge. And you're saying, we believe this is the thing. And the security person is saying to your point, they're shining like, this is what we're going to do because we agreed to it and all the people are behind them. Yes, we're going to do this and it's going to be great. Um, then you also say the strategy is we're going to loop this, right? I'd say the strategy is we're going to loop this damn thing every six months or every 12 months or every three months, depending on the dynamism inside the business to make sure we still understand the business, make sure all the players are still committed, make sure we bring along anybody new who arrived, make sure the controls are still in place and on and on and on and on and on. So for me, step four is that plan. And then the recognition that this whole mess is actually the cybersecurity strategy. It's not yeah. like this the article, which talks about that document that pops out the back end like a gumball that nobody wants to chew on, right, is the, is the strategy. The strategy is that we all agree this is a healthy and organic way to make sure our organization stays secure. Yeah, I think mean, it's spot on. I think it's brilliant. The, um, I would add, I think this is the most important step out of all of them. Mm. This is one where you, you can't really take your eye off the ball, right? You have to make sure, you know, everything's lined up, T's are crossed, I's are dotted, you've done everything you're supposed to do. Name of the game is no surprises for anybody. Right on. But this is also the time where uh, people that you've tried to make supporters, uh, people that you've asked budget dollars from uh sometimes get a little squirrely right and it's like sure. and like everybody's your friend and everybody is your supporter until the times come to ask them to write a check <laughs> right? exactly everybody loves you until they get yep. a stroke a check and that's yep. so that's exactly right but in order to a lot of times in order to get people there and ensure that you stay there on like that cycle that six month cycle um requires that like you can't screw this step up Right. But it means like you have to be continually engaged. Like this isn't a set it and forget it thing. And this is the piece where I've, I've, I've said this for the last 20 years, which is um, a security leader is, especially for like a large organization, is someone who's, uh, who's a little bit more of like a politician in the sense where like they are consensus builders. Um, they are uh team builders they're ones that kind of bring everybody along so that as you go through this cycle again and again there's no surprises you're trying to keep everybody on the same page at all the time so that way when you ask people to say i need more money or i need this or i need you to do that like no one's surprised no one's gonna be like i don't like hold on what are you talking about like i don't i don't know i don't know what you're we we never agree to this but like yeah 100 percent we did that's, that's a great ad and I'll make sure that we put it in there because what I'm hearing on top of the that that commit and the fact that this is living, breathing, changing all the time, we have to make sure that in this section of the plan, people are focused on how they're going to report, how they're going to show progress, how they're going to get re-engaged and how frequently they're going to actually be issuing communications out to both support those people who brought them there, but keep informed the people who perhaps are above everybody else sort of making the decisions. It's, it's a lot of work, man. It's a ton of work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but I think if somebody goes through this procedure that we just talked about, it is a lot healthier. I think it's a lot less stress causing because everybody's behind you. It identifies early 
problems, whether they're political problems, technical problems, gaps or budget problems, right? Yeah. Identifies them earlier and everybody it feels from the very first meeting, like they're working together all the way through. So it's not like the way this one comes out, which is your architect who writes the same security strategy for everybody. But basically in this one, until number four, when you have a plan and you got to socialize it, you haven't done anything. Right. You've basically done great security work. And it's, this is clearly written by somebody who understands the underpinnings of security, but not necessarily the underpinnings of humanity. Right. And how important it is to bring people along through this journey, because it can be hard. Yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate the patience with this, Justin. I thought it'd be a fun thing to talk about. And I'm super glad I, I was not disappointed by how much you know. So this is great. Yeah. Well, thank you for those kind words. I will be sure to put a check in the mail for you. <laughs> excellent excellent nice all right this is a good one we uh this <laughs> this went a lot longer than i thought we we're gonna go this is uh i didn't realize i could talk about security strategy or these four things for this long but it's good um oh anyway, wait if you've listened to this this episode you enjoy it you like it uh please rate us five stars on apple Podcasts wherever you listen to your podcast um, also, if you like this, please share. It um, helps Jack and I continue to keep doing all the awesome things that, that we do. And we will get you on the next episode. <laughs>